For Creamer Media's Polity, I'm Sash Nimadli. Anne Heffernan joins me today to discuss the book, Students Must Rise. Students Must Rise is a collaborative effort between many contributors, the History Workshop Advits and the Solomon Mohlangu Freedom College Trust. What was the reason for this book? Um, the Solomon Mohlangu Freedom College Trust, Samafco, approached the Vitz History Workshop late last year, actually just before the sort of wave of student protests on campuses. And they had gotten a grant from the National Lotteries Foundation to do a history of student and youth activism in South Africa. But they wanted to bring on professional historians to really guide the project. So it was really driven by them. And then collaboratively, we decided that we wanted to do something around the 40th anniversary of the Soweto Uprising because we saw that coming up in the next year and thought that was really a moment to reflect on the impact of students and young people in South African history. Can you briefly tell our viewers what the book is about? Yeah, it's, um, so it came out for the 40th anniversary of Soweto. One of the chapters is specifically about the 1976 uprising. But it's 16 chapters long, and the other 15 chapters are about a wide variety of student and youth engagement in South African politics over really the last 60 to 70 years. The earliest chapter talks about young people in um, Zurist in the 1950s and their kind of politicization around the women's movement and the anti-pass campaign. Um, and then the most current chapter talks about roads must fall and fees must fall in the 2015-2016 student protests. So it really covers a broad scope of student and youth involvement in pushing the political conversation in South Africa. Why should South Africans read this book? Oh, well, I mean, f for South African students in particular, it's, it's your history more than it is anybody else's. And I think it's a much broader and deeper history than sometimes our discussions of student uprisings give credit to. We talk about student uprisings in South Africa and we usually use 1976 as code for everything. But there's a wide variety of ways that young people have engaged with this history and with their own country and forming that country. Um, for non-South Africa, oh, sorry, you've asked about South Africans specifically, but I think it's also important for non-South Africans to see how there are commonalities between student movements across countries and across decades, and it's not a landmark for a kind of how to protest, but you do see the ways that students have, have engaged with government um, in a variety of different ways. Tell us about the significance of the title, Students Must Rise. Uh, Students Must Rise, my co-editor, Noor Niftodian, who's also here at the History Workshop at WITS, came up with that. And it's obviously a tip of the hat to the sort of collective fallism movements, particularly Fees Must Fall here at WITS and Roads Must Fall um, around the country. And I think we've been in this discourse in South Africa over the last eight months or so about everything that needs to be replace that needs to fall, that needs to be changed, that needs to be transformed, decolonized. Um, but we haven't talked so much about what needs to fill that space. If things must roll, what must come up instead? And this is really about how students have inserted themselves into those spaces. So, so Students Must Rise is our slight, slightly cheeky title. Um, but, but yeah, that's, that's where it came from. Can you discern a common thread running through the rich history of student struggles in South Africa? I think, I think what comes out when you read this book is the centrality of young people in South African political discourse over the last half a century plus. Um, they've engaged in a lot of different ways, in a lot of different spaces. This has chapters about young people in, I mean, the, the heart of urban South Africa, in Soweto, in Kailicha. Um, in Johannesburg and Cape Town and Durban, but also in rural Northwest, rural Limpopo, rural KZN. Um, and at all levels of society, at the very, very local village level, um, at the highest reaches of government, young people are engaging directly in shaping the sort of future of their country, which is really a, a kind of inspiring thing. Um, and I think that's, that's the common thread, because there are a lot of differences. There are political party differences, differences of ideology, differences of sort of forms of mobilization across the different activists who are described in these pages. 
but the drive to really change things and change things hopefully for the better is, is there throughout. Tell us the reason behind having a different author write each chapter. Um, so because the book has this sort of incredible scope, I can't think of any one person who could do justice to all of these topics. But what we've done here is taken a variety of academic experts, but also activists. So a lot of these chapters are by people who were part of the movements writing about their own experiences. Um, they're really reflective and biographical in that way, which I think gives it a richness that you don't always get in perhaps more dry academic texts. Um, so you really have personal reflections and, and deep academic expertise about each subject, whereas if any one person was to try to write about all of them, I think you would, you would lose a lot of that. There have been many books written about the 1976 Soweto student uprising. What makes this book different? There have been many books written about the 1976 uprising. It's very true. I think what makes this book different is that what it tries to do is take Soweto as its, as its pivot point, as its center, but it tries to use it to reflect much more broadly on the scope of involvement of young people in South African politics. So there's one chapter, as I said, about 1976 in Soweto specifically. There are chapters then about how that moment in Soweto impacted Mpumalanga and KwaZulu-Natal. There are chapters about how universities in Limpopo influence students in Soweto. And it's really trying to draw these much broader connections between that one particular moment and a much broader scope of activism and history of activism. Tell us about the research needed for this book. Um, so as, as I mentioned, each, as you mentioned, each chapter is written by a different author. Um, and each of these authors is experts in their particular chapter. Many of them are former activists and they're writing about their own personal reflections. So in those cases, probably they didn't do a tremendous amount of research and it was really about sitting with their memories and kind of, and maybe speaking to fellow activists. The ones that are written by academics, so I have a chapter about a uh, university in Limpopo, which is what my research is on. Um, these are people who have a great depth of experience in the particular topics. They're experts in, in their own fields. So they have years of, of expertise on these various areas. And me, because we turned the book around in an incredibly quick timeline, we were approached by Samafco in September or October of last year, um, and it was, out, it was out for the 40th anniversary of June. So people drew on a wealth of past expertise and, and research. Um, I used interviews that I've done over the last probably five years or so with activists from mostly the 1970s and 1960s um, in Limpopo. And I think other authors similarly went, went back to their archives and, and refreshed their memories about these, these topics. Did you learn anything from this book? I've learned a tremendous amount. Um, my particular area of interest is youth politics in Limpopo in the late 1960s and early 1970s. It's a very kind of narrow point, and I think that's true of most academics. We, we get our little niches. Um, but what's been so interesting about this book is to see how that moment connects not just to what's happening now, which has been very sort of evident to me as I've watched the student protests unfold, but also to what happened in the 1980s and the 1990s and the 1950s, um, to see commonalities across movements, as I've been kind of looking at the different chapters and how they intersect and speak to one another. Um, you see different historical figures come up repeatedly in different areas and kind of impacting new generations of activists, which is really impressive. What do you hope people will take away after reading this book? Um, I hope they'll take away the richness of this history. I hope that young people will take away what is possible. Um, it's, it's incredible how much students have been able to influence the changing shape of South Africa, which is a unique kind of example because of the tremendous changes the country has undergone in the last 20 years, 50 years, 100 years. Um, young people have played a big part in shaping what they want their country to be. They're doing it now. 
um, that's that's really incredible. I think it's inspirational to to see it and and hopefully to read about it. That was Anne Heffernan discussing the book Students Must Rise.